On Nationwide this evening, in the last of our week of programmes from County Mayo, we meet shepherds and their sheepdogs to learn about their unique relationship keeping their flocks safe. And we explore Ballycroy National Park, a vast and remote wilderness. It's there that evidence has been discovered about how people lived some 5,000 years ago. As they have done for centuries, shepherds have ensured their sheep may safely graze on high in terrain that hasn't changed much through the ages. To do so, they rely on not just a faithful companion, but a working partner, the sheepdog. The wild mountain landscape of counties like Galway and Mayo means the unique bond between a shepherd and a sheepdog is still the most effective way of controlling a flock, often spread over thousands of acres. That's why one young man with an eye on sheep farming as a career has come here to Mayo to learn the intricacies of that relationship. Newport Shepherds is both a tourist attraction for visitors and a shepherd's academy for people like Sean Joyce. Back home we have a farm and Dad has this great dog, his name is Max. And I kind of wanted to be able to train my own dog so I could work my own duck for when I have my own friend. Come by. I love ducks and just the idea to be able to work them, it's just, yeah. In the beginning, it was pretty hard to get the hang of it, but then once I did, it was, it was fine. Come by, lie down, come by. Shepherds share a language with their dogs. Come by, come by can mean turn left, Always. stand, wait, steady, Always. are all other clear commands. When the dog hears come the words, boy. That'll do. It Lie knows down. its work is Lie done down. and it's time to stop. Roxy, it's a language that has ensured the dog's genetic stealth is even more finely tuned. Dad didn't think he was the best because, well, he didn't know the come by command. He just done away and point in the direction. Scientists now believe sheepdogs are programmed to work on two simple principles herding the sheep together by closing gaps between the sheep and then, having closed that gap, driving the sheep forward. Sean is already learning about the qualities that make a good working dog. I think a good sheep dog is a dog that knows the commands or the instructions and Oi. a dog that isn't Oi. too sticky, like too tight around them or Oi. too loose so they're not too far away. Oi. What makes a good shepherd? A good shepherd is someone who knows the difference between a good dog and a bad dog. <laughs> Sean's family are happy to see his interest in working dogs develop. Our older dog is now fully retired and uh, so Sean has a young pup for himself and he wants to train her himself and he is, he in time wants to go dog trialling with her. So he wants to learn from people that are experienced in that area. We would have a hill farm and we would only use uh, dogs on the hill sheep really. So for, for trialling, he's coming here to people that are more than capable of tra training him, him and their, the dog hopefully in time. Attention to detail is incredibly important in, the, in that area. So that's why I wouldn't have any experience in, in, in trialling. And uh, so coming here with Paul, he's started to uh, uh, really get to terms with the whole idea and the concept of it and giving the commands right and, and, and that. For farmers like the Joyces, a good working dog is an invaluable partner. A dog is, is number one, a companion and around the house and that and, 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 and a very good family pet, but an incredibly important tool. There's, I have no piece of equipment or machinery in our farm that's more important than the dog. You cannot have hill sheep without a, a very good dog. Newport sheep farmer Alan Moran and Chilean dog trainer Paul Walker set up their business last year. Newport Shepherds is now a popular place for people to visit and see how sheep dogs learn to work with their flock. It's very rewarding to, to share our life and like I, I, I see ourselves as being very lucky to live who we are and work with dogs and work with with nature and people and to share our experiences. I think it's, it's, uh, it's very rewarding for us. Grew up in the town in Newport, yeah, and 
followed Alan out here to the countryside. Childhood sweethearts. Yes. Do you know what? I wouldn't change it because we're having people coming constantly here to the house and for the kids to see other people and to see what their dad does and what he loves, they love it. You know, as we just say here, the door is always open. There's always people coming. It can be stressful if we're getting ready to go out the door in the Jeep and driving down the driveway and people call to see Alan because they'd have been working Monday to Friday. Their weekends are off, so they'd call here. But it comes part and parcel with it all. And, and it's wonderful for the children to get out, and the school children, because a lot of them mightn't have seen, you know, um, the working dog, sheep, even puppies are even held, you know, puppies are even touched sheep. So it's a brilliant addition that they can do that for the schools now. Lauren Kerrens is a local farmer. She's also come to Newport Shepherds to learn to work with her crossbreed dog, Skylar. She's a Huntaway crossed with a Collie. So Huntaways are a New Zealand dog. They're built for herding in massive stations. She covers so much ground. She's a very elegant runner. And they work a lot using their voice as well, pros and cons, but um, just different to the Collie. I like her. She's unusual, very loyal, very obedient, and just a natural with the sheep. And very clever too. Very, very intelligent. Yes. She's more than a pet. She is our Unbike. colleague. Unbike. She is our Unbike. sidekick. Unbike. She comes ever with us on the farm and yeah. she's going to be very useful for us. She loves coming here. She knows the minute we hop in the Jeep that this is where we're coming. And she's very impatient. I often get the chance to run some of the other dogs because I'm a beginner as well. And she doesn't like to wait her turn. She's very keen to go. She's only started her training. Um, we've only been to a couple of sessions, but it's just great to see the progress. She's a quick learner and I'm just, just about keeping up with her. These are a little bit young. They're only three weeks, but um, they will be superstars one day. Tess is the, the best bitch from uh, Paul and she's spread with the best uh, dog from Alan, Sweep. Will you find it hard to say goodbye to them? <laughs> Yeah, you can become very attached to puppies, yeah. right? They're just, they're great therapy, you know? If you're feeling any way down, spend a few moments with a puppy and you're feeling much more relaxed. These mountains provide thousands of acres of common grazing, as they have done for centuries. Nothing has changed at that line. You're not gonna do anything with the landscape up here. And you're not going to do anything without a, without a good dog with you. Yeah. Um, and it's amazing with, with all the technology and everything that's going, drones, bikes, quads, but nothing can replace the dog. You, you cannot travel, there's no other accessibility to here without a dog. Paul Walker found his way to Mayo from the Andes in Chile through a love of working with animals. I came here to work with horses. I'm, I'm, I'm officially you know, a horse trainer. I, I always felt very, very attracted to dogs because I find the relationship of trust and respect that you create with a dog is much more demanding than the one you create with a horse. That's my opinion. So Why is that? Because with a horse, uh, the horse, you train him uh, with different, different methods of training, more or less stress, but it's always man with beast. Man is over beast. But with the dog, when you have the dog working at 400 meters, he has to understand and he has to obey your command. He has to trust you and he has to respect you. So developing that relationship, according to me, is much more difficult and demanding on your part than the one that you can create with a horse. If anyone knows the qualities required for a dog to fulfill a working role that requires such stamina and cunning, these men do. Personally, I like the good temperament. I like them to be friendly. I like them to have a good feel for sheep, uh, natural ability, that's, uh, that's inherited, and well, stamina and looks, if, if you can, but mostly is good temperament and, and a good feel for sheep. Same for you, Alan? Uh, very same, very same, yeah, those things, power, stamina, and uh, yeah, the temperament, so. There's nothing more rewarding than, than going and picking a young pup or buying a young pup, rearing them yourself, and seeing them grow and develop and, and then turn them into a, a useful working dog. It's, I can't think of anything more rewarding. They believe, however, that dogs like these are not suitable as domestic pets. A work dog has to be bred to work and you have to have an active lifestyle and you have to treat him with respect. You know, having a work dog that is highly driven for work, locked up in a kennel or locked up in a, in a small yard is cruelty. So we really, uh, emphasize that a work dog has to have physical activity, a good food, a good handling, has to have boundaries in their mind. 
If not, they can turn out to be problems. And they, it, what we receive is is product of many, many generations of, of selection done by farmers, so we respect them. Did you ever look at a good dog and wonder, was he or she more intelligent than you were? Yeah, <laughs> we do. <laughs> It's something that's just built in. It, it, it cannot be taught. It's, yeah. it's pre-programmed there through centuries of selective breeding. Voice commands is when the dog is nearby and he can hear you. And the whistle is, is, a, is an instrument to make uh, contact with the dog when he's far away and he... And so it carries it, further. It, yeah, it could be wind or it could be distance. Yeah. Alan Moran is a fifth generation sheep farmer still facing many of the same challenges as his forebears. The wool from his sheep is, however, no longer of much value. It's tough, especially when you're trying to make a living on the type of land that we have here. As, as you can see, it's, it's, it's marginal, it's hilly, it's, uh, it's not very versatile, so um, it, it's tough. There'd be what? There could be 400 kilos of wool there um, if, if it made 50 euros, would be about it. Yeah. So wool is worthless? It's worthless really, no, yeah. Um, the only reason we're taking it off is for the welfare of the animals. You know, it has to be taken off yearly um, to, you know, stop the sheep getting um, different sort of illnesses. And, and can any use be made of this wool? Um, they're badly trying to find a market for it now. I, I've heard of um, that they're trying to um, use it for insulation and houses and stuff like that. But this wool is, is a lot more coarse than the lowland sheep. Now, the lowland wool is worth more than this. The most common sheep in this area are blackface sheep, originally from Scotland, as are border collie sheepdogs. Hardy and suitable for mountain conditions, both have adopted to their challenging environment. Well, to be able to survive on the, we're right on the edge of Europe here, and we're getting the first rattle of the, of the Atlantic, you know, all sorts of weather, and they can survive in areas, and not only survive, but they can thrive in areas where other sheep just wouldn't, wouldn't be able to live. The survival rate is actually very, very high, bar now maybe um, going into a, into a hole in springtime when they're a bit weak and they're carrying lambs in springtime. They're under that extra bit of pressure and if they come across a flood or a, you know, a soft spot, uh, a few can maybe get caught, but uh, as a rule, they're agile and they're able to spring across these wet places and they're great, they're great sheep to forage than just even uh, two or three foot of snow wouldn't bother them. Well, with a population of over 4 million sheep in this country, it's unlikely those sheep dogs will be short of work anytime soon. Join us in part two when we'll discover what's buried beneath this ancient landscape and get a fascinating glimpse into the way humans lived here 5,000 years ago. You're very welcome back to Nationwide and to one of the country's true wildernesses here in North Mayo. If proof were needed of how little has changed in this landscape for thousands of years, then the discovery of human remains in a cave here provides a unique glimpse into how people lived here 5,000 years ago. I was lucky enough to stumble across um, boulder chambers up in the mountains in the Nathan Bay Range behind us and uh, made the discovery of up to 10 individuals who were laid to rest inside in the caves dating back to 5,600 years ago. It's a find that has been described not just as rare, but incredibly important. This is a hugely significant find, not just for County Mayo, but for the country as a whole. Uh, the site was very, very well preserved. And when Michael Chambers went into this little cave in 2016, he was probably the first person to go in there in about four and a half thousand years. What we found at that site was that um, the dead had been brought to this little cave before placement at a burial place much later on. 
Neolithic people, starting about five and a half thousand years ago, had dug a little pit in the cave and they would bring corpses of the dead up to the cave and lay them out in this pit. And the corpses were left there for maybe six months or 12 months. And then people came back after the flesh had decomposed. They collected the larger bones, the skull bones, the arm bones, leg bones, and removed them for burial at a different location. So we had two adults who were over 45 years of age, and this would have been considered quite elderly in the Neolithic during this Stone Age period. We also had younger adults, we had teenagers, we had two younger children, and we also had a young baby who was only a few months old. Thankfully, ancient DNA analysis was possible on two of the individuals, and this has given us a lot of information. The two individuals were two adult males, and again, the, the DNA analysis provided some fascinating results. We were able to tell a little bit about what they looked like. So both of these men had dark brown or black hair. They are dark skinned and they had brown eyes, and both of them were lactose intolerant. One of the, the most important things about this site is it's a part of the jigsaw that we had been missing for a long time. So we know that people were dying during the Neolithic and we have lots of the burial monuments where we find bones ending up as final burial places. But the in-between sites where we know the bodies were being laid out, allowing the flesh to decompose, most of those sites have not been discovered. And to find such a pristine site in such excellent condition and excellent state of preservation was really exciting. Limerick-born writer, poet and naturalist Sean Lysett made his home here over 20 years ago. For him, this area is a constant source of inspiration. The bottom line is that there is such a record of human history and human experience in a place like this. Even though in many respects it seems to be just a byword for emptiness and desertion. Um, people use words like bleak uh, to describe it or wild is the, is the new uh, buzzword if you like. But people have lived in these places since ancient times. There is a recognition now that uh, North Mayo has a landscape that is given to us on a scale that is quite unusual. He's not one of those who might resent having to share a unique place with others. The Ballycroy National Park covers, after all, 15,000 hectares, approximately the size of 15,000 rugby pitches. If we have more people with that kind of um, conservation ethos, I think it will help the prospects of this area. I think some of the aspects perhaps of neglect that have been there in the past have reflected on the fact that there haven't been enough visitors, there haven't been enough people with the kind of um, the, the outside view. Emigration from Mayo has been almost as constant as the landscape itself. Obviously Mayo has been greatly affected by emigration not just in the 20th century but, but before that. There are indices which suggest that it is an area of deprivation. When you look at, you know, dependence on social welfare, certain health statistics, when you look at participation in education, th there are um, indices that would put North uh, West Mayo, you know, in, in a category similar to some of the urban areas. I think the legacy of uh, emigration has a lot of positives uh, on this county because so many people have spent a portion of their lives in Scotland or England and you will hear regional English uh, accents all over uh, Mayo. No one bats an eyelid if people are speaking with a Liverpool or, um, or, or a, a London accent and I think that brings uh, an enrichment of its own. Um, I believe that Mayo is a very outward looking county because of its diaspora. Within this preserved area, there's also an abundance of wildlife, plants and fauna. We have uh, a population of red deer, um, mostly confined to the forests, but on a lucky day you might see them out on the open hillside as well. Um, we have uh, pine martens and foxes and badgers, particularly in the woods. Then on the bird front, uh, I suppose some of the highlights, some of the gems of a day out in Wild Nathan would be 
disturbing a brace of red grouse, uh, seeing a peregrine falcon wheeling off a cliff face, um, perhaps at migration time, seeing hen harriers uh, quartering a hillside, and then uh, you might have the surprise of a, of a, of a merlin or a, a kestrel hunting. I suppose for me the absolute highlight is to see an eagle in this particular landscape and I've managed it on four occasions in about uh, 20 years so far. Goodness. Possibly a wanderer from the Donegal population or maybe even down from Scotland. Because nature is constantly changing, there are new animals travelling through here all the time. Uh, the great spotted woodpecker is expanding across Ireland and has been seen as far west as Belter Lock and it's probably just on the cusp of recolonizing uh, North Mayo. The park begins as you head west from Mulrani. Its vastness is immediately evident. You go through this landscape that's untouched by humans and it's amazing to have that still here in the west of Ireland. The park's biodiversity is carefully managed. The heather has been let go freely again, so you see the hares coming back down from the mountains and the foxes and whatnot. And it's important that we look after this and keep it as wild as possible for these animals to thrive. We've seen a lot of kestrels uh, beginning to hover over the boglands, which is a great indicator that there's mice and, and common lizards making their way back. Also, you'd have perking falcons nesting in the hills around here and uh, the sea eagles do often make an appearance circling around the mountains and head out, uh, heading out again. We do tell people, if they keep their eyes open, you see a wide range of biodiversity. And I know a lot of people like to see the bigger stuff, but the smaller stuff is just as equally as important. Over in our dipping pond there, you'd see a wide range of animals such as diving beetles, dragonflies, damselflies, and uh, back swimmers. And then as you walk along the trail itself, you'll see lots of captive pillars, you'll see beetles crossing around. And if you're lucky enough, you'll see an odd mouse that's through popping up across the trail, and even a mountain here. And just nearby us then on the Clegg and Coastal Trail, you'd see the ossers coming in from time to time and seals out in the waters and then a wide range of different kind of wading birds coming into the shore. Well here at the Visitor Centre we have a lovely family friendly two kilometre loop trail and one nearby us in the Clegg and Coastal Trail. And on the far side of the park, for the more of interest people, we have lots larger loop walks that go up to 13 kilometres off trail walks and the Bangor itself, is itself, which is 40 kilometres in total distance from Newport to Bangor, 30 kilometres of that will bring you right through the wilderness of the National Park. But you can easily have the, the, the mini shorter experience here within that, that short walk around. For the family starting off and uh, people who just want to get a taste of it, you could come down here and um, you get a good taste and feel of the National Park. Plus, we bring you out and show you the wild meadows and, and show you all the biodiversity that you can expect. Mayo people may enjoy one of the most